Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to be able to be out here again with you this morning, that we can come together, that we can join together in worship and singing praises to our God and turning our attention and focus back to Him, to His Son, and the things that they have done for us and that we can spend this hour in prayer and in worship of Him. We're thankful for all our visitors that we have this morning. We invite you to come back any time that you're in the area, that you have the opportunity to stop by, that you have to come and worship together with us. We've been encouraged by your presence, and we hope that these, this worship this morning will be encouraging to you. If you would this morning, start out by opening up to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and we'll be focusing there on the phrase that is written there in Revelation chapter 14 there in verse 13 this morning. John speaks there as part of this vision saying, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Holidays are coming up. And for many of us, that's a hard time. It was announced earlier at the start of services that I'm going to be gone this week. And the reason I'm going to be gone is basically I'm having a second Thanksgiving with one side of the family. And we're having it earlier because we have the opportunity now to gather together and we're going to spend time with family and we're going to get together and we're going to celebrate. We're going to study together. We're going to play games. We're going to hang out for the week and we're going to get to spend time with one another. That's what we're doing. This is also the first family gathering with this side of the family that we're not going to have my father there. Some of you got the pleasure of getting to meet my father, although very briefly when he came up here a couple times to visit. If you've spent much time with him at all, he is not only a large man in stature, he was a large man in presence. You knew walking in the door that he was there. He was loud, he was boisterous, he was laughing, he was telling stories, he was excited. His presence was felt by everyone and it's greatly going to be missed this week. And as much as I'm going to miss him, and I know the other, bre other brethren and friends and family that are going to be there are going to miss him, we have this understanding. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That's what I want to look at this morning. These are things that are talked about over and over. We're going to examine here both in the Old Testament and the New Testament this morning. That God repeatedly gave encouragement to his faithful, to his children, to his brethren, to his followers, that death is not the end. That yes, we mourn with those that mourn, that are on this earth, that family will be missed, that friends will be missed, that loved ones will be missed. But for the loved ones that go on before us, it is for their gain. Blessed are they. So let's look at that this morning. Let's start by turning back to the Old Testament. If you'll turn to Psalm 116 there in verse 15. One of many psalms, and we could spend all morning just looking at the psalms, if you just want to look at Old Testament, that talks about how blessed it is when God's saints, when God's people, when God's followers leave this earth. That it is also a time for rejoicing. Psalm 116 verse 15 tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's not because he rejoices when someone has to die, but that they finally get to leave this earth. They finally get to escape temptation, pain, suffering. They get to grow closer to him. Their task and their toil on this earth is over. Similar statement made over in Isaiah chapter 57, if we turn over there and look at verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 57 there in verse 1, and Isaiah is now writing, speaking as God tells him to speak. The righteous perish, and no man takes it to his heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Isaiah is writing here saying, listen, the righteous are going to perish and sometimes we don't stop and consider what that means. They're entering their rest. They're escaping turmoil. They're escaping calamity. Isaiah speaks about that a lot in his book. Israel, this is the turmoil. This is the calamity. These are the things that are about to befall you. Because of your unfaithfulness, you're about to be taken away into captivity. Here is everything that's going to happen to you because you are so wicked, but the righteous when they perish. 
they get to escape this. They were faithful. They have walked in their uprightness. And they're going to be taken away from this evil that's about to come. There are blessings that I have definitely considered with me and my family, with my father in this last year, that there's a lot of things that he's missed that he would have had a lot of say about. The divisions and the violence and things going on in our country, he would have had a lot to say about that and he would have been heartbroken to see it. The sickness and the death that has swept through our loved ones and has taken some of our loved ones, he would have been heartbroken to see some of that and he would have had a lot to say about that and he would have had a lot of wisdom to give. Even in the last year, I've missed that, hey, I haven't had my father. I've had a father-in-law that is now a new father, but I haven't had my father in the first year of my marriage to go to advice for. But look at everything that he's gotten to miss that's on this earth that's even happened in the last year. And he's resting in peace. He got to avoid this. He didn't have to worry about this. He didn't have to worry about having no immune system with the leukemia that was taking him away. That, hey, my mom just now has COVID-19, but ultimately our prayer is, yeah, she's pretty healthy. She's probably going to be fine. Right now, she just feels like a bad case of allergies. If my father had gotten something like that, it would have probably been a death sentence. Mom would have been in turmoil this entire year worried about him, that he's in the home and he could catch something so easily and it would pretty much be a death sentence for him. He got to escape watching his wife possibly going through all that this last year if he'd have been alive. God's promise is the righteous get to leave that behind. It's gone. Similar case over in Luke chapter 16. I recognize this is in the New Testament but it's still under the old law. When we pick up in Luke chapter 16 and we're looking there as God is talking, I'm sorry, as Christ is talking about the rich man and the Lazarus. He's talking about what happens to the dead when they die right now under the old law. This is the situation that awaits people and here's the situation that awaits those that are righteous and here's the situation that awaits those that are unfaithful. When you pick up there in Luke chapter 16 there in verse 19, Jesus says, there was a rich, certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. He was full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and they licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. But the rich man died and was also was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. When you skip on down to verse 25, he says, but Abraham, my son, I'm sorry, but Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Likewise, Lazarus received evil things, but now he is comforted. Lazarus was evidently a faithful man. He believed in God. He worshipped in God. He served him as he, best as he could. And calamity fell upon him. I don't know what his entire life circumstance was, but by the end of his life, he is covered in sores. He is dying from sickness and disease. He's dying apparently from starvation because he just would be satisfied with the crumbs from this man's table. And he's not getting the mercy, he's not getting the love, he's not getting the help on this earth. And sometimes even God's faithful people pass away that way on earth. But he's more blessed in this situation now than he ever was in his lifetime. He's in Abraham's bosom. He is being taken care of by God. Now he is being comforted. Blessed are the dead. They are promised comfort when they leave this earth. That was the promise under the old law. It was reiterated over and over and over again. If you were righteous, if you follow Moses and the prophets, if you follow God's word that he has revealed to you and how to serve him faithfully under the old law, no, there was not a baptism for the remission of sins, but there was still ways that God told his people how to be faithful. This is the promise of comfort that you will receive. 
And when the rich man, who when you finish off verse 25, is being tormented, because evidently he was not faithful, when he shows concern for his family members that are still on the earth, let me go back and tell them. And Abraham tells him, no, that's impossible. Listen to his answer in verse 29. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he answered, no, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded by one. They will be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The promise under God's old law is the same as in Revelation 14. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Wonderful is the death and precious is the death in his sight of his saints, of his followers. They get to escape what is coming. Ultimately, he says the dead are going to await that judgment day. When you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2 there in verse 4, read there along with me. 2 Peter gives a little bit of a description of what's going to look like and what God, what God is doing to those that are dead and are dying. 2 Peter chapter 2, if you'll back up there, actually verse 3, and then we'll read verse 4. It talks about the idea that here's these false teachers, here's these prophets, here's those that are teaching false doctrine. By covetousness, in verse 3, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. There is a day coming when they will be judged, everyone, for what they have done on this earth. Verse 4, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight pre people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing them from the flood and up on the world of the ungodly. Continues on and talks about this idea. God is saving those for judgment day. He has done this for angels. He has done this for those that have died that are faithful. It's a description we get in Luke chapter 16. Here's basically a waiting place. It's borrowed from that word Tartarus. It's a waiting place for judgment. When the unfaithful die, they're going to be in torments, and they're going to be in pain awaiting judgment day. The faithful, when they die, are given immediate peace. They're given immediate comfort, and they're waiting for an even greater one to come soon after whenever judgment day occurs. That's where the loved ones that probably every person sitting here this morning can tell us of some family member of theirs, of some friend of theirs that has passed on. The faithful of those we can take comfort in that they're blessed and they're taken care of. When Jesus speaks to the thief in Luke 23 there in verse 43 and he tells him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, you'll be with me where Lazarus went. Today, you will be in Abraham's bosom. You will be awaiting going to heaven for all of eternity. And until then, you will go with me and you will be comforted. Jesus went there as well. When we go over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 27, sometimes we think of that word Hades, and depending on your translation, you may get a slightly different word. But that idea of Hades, that idea of Tartarus, that idea of here's this waiting place that we go to after we die, Jesus says, I went there too. In Acts 2 and verse 27, when Peter's preaching the first gospel sermon, and he's understanding he's quoting David here, and he's talking about what Jesus has gone through, and this is where they go, part of David's message there, and even, though, even part of it is a prophecy about Christ. Acts 2 and verse 27, You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. That Jesus went to Hades. He went to that waiting place. He was there for a couple days. Then he came back. They had an understanding, even under the old law, that there is a place we go after death awaiting some judgment day. There is a place that Jesus is going to go, the Messiah is going to go, it's going to be temporary, but there's a place we're going to go, and it's not a permanent new home. All of us will go there, and you will not forget us there for all of eternity. It's temporary. 
Then, when Jesus comes back, we'll go to heaven. Just as he did in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Makes a distinction there in John chapter 20 there in verse 17. Okay, Jesus first, when he died, went to Hades. But after he came back, notice where he ascended to. There's a distinction there. Different words are used there. John 20 and verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. I've not gone to heaven yet. I went to that waiting place. I went to Abraham's bosom where the thief on the cross, where Lazarus, where so many faithful that have died in the Lord are waiting Soon I'm going to my father's side. That's what we know about what happens to the blessed, what happens to the dead that die under the old law. Then we get to the new law, and now we have more information. That's part of John's message there. It's part of God's message there in Revelation 14 and verse 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. It's not that they're going to be better off than those who died under the old law. We now have even more assurances and more information about what awaits us after his faithful die under the new law. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 there in verse 6, Paul talks about this, and we'll look at a few of Paul's passages, but if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 there, Paul talks about this idea of what's coming after he dies. Paul's attitude when it comes to death is, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Sometimes when you talk about death and when we hear talk about people talk about death, they talk about it as if it's the end. That nothing else comes after, or this is the end, there's nothing else you can do, there's nothing else to look forward to, this is the end. Paul looks at it as though I'm leaving to go on a journey to a better home. Death is really the beginning. My time on this earth is but a vapor. It's a pit stop. Now I'm departing and I'm going to go home. Peter has the same attitude. If you turn it back to 2 Peter chapter 1 there, there verses 14 and 15. 2 Peter chapter 1, pick up there in verse 14 with me if you will. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Christ Jesus showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that always you have a reminder of these things after my decease. Shortly I'm going to depart and give up my temporary home, my temporary tent on this earth. This bag of dust that God created for me to move around on this earth for a few decades, that's going to go, and now I'm going to go home. And I'm writing these things to you so that you have the same understanding. That even after I leave, you recognize, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Death is not something to fear for his saints. It's not something to be terrified of. It's not something to quiver and shake. Finally going home. Death, if you look at Paul's attitude again, back up there to Philippians chapter 1. When Paul is looking at, all right, the end of my life looks like it's very short going to come. I seem to be a little bit of a crossroads and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to leave the earth this time or if God has more work for me here. Look at his attitude in Philippians 1 beginning in verse 21. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 21, Paul writes, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I continue on living, I can serve Christ. I can teach you. I can teach others. I can continue to serve my Savior. There is work I can still do on this earth. But to die, that's the real treasure. That's the real gain. It continues on in verse 22 as well. To live, is, to, live is, to live in Christ, to die is gain. Verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, 
having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I have sat at the deathbed of a few loved ones, the most recent one being my father, as they take their last breaths. As you spend your last few days with them, you can even hear them talk. I want to stay longer with you. I want to stay longer with my wife, with my kids, with my friends, with my brethren. I don't want to leave them because I know it will leave heartbreak. I know that there's more I can do to encourage them, to uplift them, to strengthen those that are around me. There's a side of faith, the faithful brethren, that don't want to leave. Because they recognize there's more work that can be done. My father was very much that attitude. Didn't want to leave his wife. He didn't want to leave his kids. Didn't want to leave his brethren. Didn't want to leave his parents. Didn't want to leave so many loved ones behind. But to die is gain. I get to go home. I don't have to suffer like I have the last few years. I'm thankful to God that I got more time and more opportunities. And he even emboldened me in my last few years. Even more so than he had a reputation for. To speak, to encourage, to uplift, to edify, and to challenge. Looks like my time is gone. Even on his deathbed, as we're surrounding him for hours, I very much believe he was holding on to life while we were surrounding him the moment everyone walked away. And he had a few minutes of peace and he wasn't surrounded. I think he was holding on for those kind of moments. Everyone's not standing around me anymore. I can take my last breath. I can have some peace. I can pass on. Yes, our loved ones want to stay behind with us. But to die is gain. There's so much more awaiting me. We studied that two weeks ago. The blessings that await me in heaven, that's my home. It's where I want to go. And it's where the loved ones that have gone on before us that are faithful look forward to. Again, attitude over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there in verse 5. Paul reiterates again. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident. Yes, we are well pleased rather than to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. It's the kind of faith I have seen in so many brethren. I've seen in my father. Many of you have seen in your loved ones. I have an unshakable faith of knowing what awaits me. That yes, I do have a home on this earth. I do have loved ones. I do have friends. I do have family. But this isn't my real home. Moth, rust, time destroys what's here. Even my loved ones that are on this earth will not be here forever. God's faithful understand this. We have sufficient and plentiful evidence to know this world is not my home. It's a temporary dwelling place, and to go home to God is far, far better. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. It's time to go home. They understand, we studied even some of these things a couple weeks ago, that when I get to go home, I get access to the tree of life again. What we lost access to in Genesis chapter 2, finally we get to return to this. When you read some of the commendations there and the challenges there in Revelation 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus has for some of those churches there in Asia, look what he has his commendation for in Revelation chapter 2 there in verse 7 to Ephesus. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. His commendation there to those brethren is, brethren, hold on just a little longer. Be faithful. Be strong. Take these assurances. Very soon, if you are faithful, and you die in that situation. You could eat of that tree. He opens up the letter to those churches with that promise, and he ends the letter with those promises. If you turn over to the words, the end of the chapter, Revelation 22, there in verse 14. Revelation 22 and verse 14, his promise for those brethren and for us today. What awaits us in heaven? Verse 14 of chapter 22, blessed are those who, in, who do his commandments, that they have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter through the gates of the city. This becomes your new Eden. This becomes your new home, and even then it's probably going to be better than what was on this earth beforehand. You get to come back to God's presence. You get to look forward to the fact that you don't have to face death ever again. Revelation 2 and verse 11, again, a commendation to brethren in Smyrna who had already lost loved ones. They had lost brethren due to torments and trials and persecution. God gives a promise and an assurance again, verse 11 of chapter 2, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. He's not talking about you won't die again although there is that promise. No, if you want to know what the second death is, look at 21 and verse 8 of Revelation. There Jesus describes what the second death is going to be in Revelation 21 and verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Brethren, I'm giving you an assurance and a promise. You have a new home in heaven. You will not face hell if you remain faithful, if you listen, if you obey, if you keep my commandments. You get to escape the temporary pains and consequences of this earth and the eternal ones you get to completely avoid. His promise there again, if you look at Revelation 3 there in verse 5, when he writes to the church at Sardis. 3 in verse 5, he tells, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. You're going to be written there for all of eternity. When you stand there on judgment day, Jesus will remember your name. He will speak your name. He will tell his Father, no, this one is faithful. This one has served you well. This one has done everything in their power to serve God faithfully. They get to come home. Again, he bookends the book by chapter 20 there in verse 12, talking about these things again. John gives this description of this vision. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in those books. And down in verse 15 it continues, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The promise is you remain faithful, you obey me, and your name will be there for eternity. Your name will be there on judgment day. You want another passage that really talks about this concept about how blessed are the dead? This was a concern for the Thessalonian church. Those brethren in Thessalonica had this idea, and it was already being a thing that was preached at that time, that if you die in the first century A.D., that Christ is going to return any day now. If you die, then you've missed him. You don't get to go to heaven. They were preaching then the same as some people try to preach and say, teach today. No, death is the end, and if you die, you've missed it. God understood that this was a thing that brethren deal with, that this is a question that they have. Paul sought to answer those questions 
as inspired by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning there in verse 13, Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring him with him those who sleep in Jesus. Brethren, the reminder here is for us this morning as well. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We don't look at our friends, our family, and our loved ones who have gone on before us, who were faithful in Christ, and worry that we'll never, ever get to see them again. If they lived faithfully, if we lived faithfully, we have a promise and a comfort that we'll get to be in heaven together again. Brethren, they've not missed the opportunity. They just got to leave this world a little bit sooner. They got to escape the corruptions and the torments and the afflictions of this life. They're better off than we are. When Paul continues on in chapter 5 there, verses 9 through 11, no, you want to know what God's final day is going to look like. Verse 9, beginning of chapter 5, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another. Edify one another, just as you are also doing. Take heart that death is not the end. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. You believe, just as Paul wrote, that Jesus Christ came to this earth. He died for our sins. His soul was not allowed to see corruption. That he was not kept in Hades, but he was resurrected. If God was able to do that, and if you believe that, also take faith that God's not going to forget those who have passed on before us. They're blessed. They served their faithful lives, and they get to await eternity in heaven. And while I am not in a rush to leave this earth, I have a wife that I've been married to just over a year. I don't want to leave her. I do have friends and family and loved ones that I do want to spend time with. I have those that I can still teach, that I can still edify, that I can still encourage. There's still more work I can do for the Christ on this earth. But if his decision is today, your time is up, and I am faithful to him, I'm blessed. Then I get to go home. If you want that assurance this morning, there's only one way to get it. You need to be a Christian. If you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, and there is sin in your life, remember that second half of the phrase, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. If you die today, if God returns today and says, this is it, no more time on this earth, it's time for judgment day, then your life doesn't end in the Lord, you've ended it serving Satan. The promises and the blessings in that eternal home in heaven will not be for you. It's not because God doesn't want you to be there. He's giving you an opportunity, and this may be your last one this morning. So take it. Come forward, confess him as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and be baptized and serve him faithfully however much longer you may have on this earth. And then when you die, you will be blessed because you served him faithfully and you get to await a home in heaven for all of eternity. If you are here this morning and you are a Christian, but you've fallen away, you have gone astray and you have not been serving the Lord, Today could be your last day as well. Tragedy, sickness, accidents, anything can strike us at any time. So today, make your calling an election sure. If there is sin in your life and you need to correct it, do it now. 
whether by praying to God and asking him for forgiveness or coming forward and confessing something that's brought shame upon God's name, that you want to make it right, that you want to ask for the prayers of the brethren, that you want to be encouraged, we will happily pray with you. We will pray for you. We will encourage you. We will do whatever we can because we want you to die in the Lord as well. I do not wish anyone not to be in heaven that is here this morning. And so if there's any way that we can help you this morning by coming forward, by asking for prayers, by being baptized, whatever the case may be, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.